privilege to, to be in this to be in this together. And just to be here, it's incredible to be in God's presence. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Shofar uh, Paketberg, and before that in Shofar Sirius. And uh, you know, the demographic is different, it's more rural area there. Uh, a lot of uh, farmers in that area. But, you know, the presence of God is the same. It's just incredible. You know, when we worship God, it's God's presence is there. And it's incredible as a show for our family, just the passion for God's presence and to be with the Lord and to be with each other is what binds us together. And so, uh, also, warm welcome to you guys uh, watching. Um, thank you for inviting us into, into your home as well. And so, we didn't talk about what time we, we finished the second service, brother. You gave me a strict timeline for the first one. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> Twelve-ish. Hallelujah. Okay, let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much, God, that we can be in your, in your presence, and thank you for what you have done already. Um, just now, God, as we were worshiping you, thank you for what you are speaking into our hearts, what you are whispering, Lord, into our spirits, and, and we are privileged to be in your presence, God. Privileged to have an audience with the King. Thank you for inviting us, Lord, and as that sign outside says at the gate, that you are welcoming us home, and that our hearts, Lord, this morning can, can return home and taste something of heaven when we will ultimately be home. Thank you for a taste of heaven even today, God. Thank you, Lord. I surrender to you. I yield my thoughts, my words, Lord, to you, and I pray that you would come and have your way, Lord. Jesus' name, amen. So this, this morning, I want to talk to you guys a little bit around something that has been just burning in my heart as I was thinking and just meditating upon a lot of the changes that we are, are going through in the world and as we are going through in our nation and even within our, our families. Um, I've spoken to so many people who say that this has been, um, like Charles Dickens says in uh, Tale of Two Cities, the best of times and the worst of times. A combination of, of incredible times, exhilarating times, and yet deep valleys and, and high mountains at the, at the same time. And the amazing thing about Christianity and about our faith is that the, the Christian faith has never been afraid of tough times. Amen? The Christian faith has been born in tough times. The Christian faith has flourished even in the midst of tremendously difficult times because we are more than... Um, buildings of brick and stone. We are more than programs. We are more than Sunday services and Wednesday meetings and Bible school seminars. We are more than the songs that we sing. We have something supernatural that is inside of us, something that cannot be contained, cannot be limited, cannot be squashed. It has survived and not just survived, but it has flourished in spite of the best efforts of dictators and economic and political systems. The church of Jesus Christ is that mustard seed that has fallen into the ground and that has grown stronger and stronger and stronger. And you and I, we form part of a great cloud of witnesses. We are a resilient people. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is resilient people. I've been reading this little book called uh, uh, Jesus Freaks. It's part two. There was the first one many years ago and then there's part two. And it speaks about how Christianity, because of the power of the resurrection, has gone from strength to strength, how people who otherwise would, would not go through uncomfortable moments and uncomfortable times, would, when they meet Jesus and they have a revelation of the power of the resurrection, would willingly and joyfully go to their deaths because they understand that there's something more than just this life. How, how wives and children would write to their fathers who are in prison and, and would tell them, please, whatever you do, doesn't matter what they do to us, how they, how they uh, threaten um, you, that they will torture us and kill us. And don't forsake the faith. So there's a higher reward. Don't think of us, think of heaven. I mean, for, for a wife and for a child to write that to a father in prison, you say, stay the course for, for, for missionaries and believers to, to run into, the, into the, the amphitheaters and to willingly submit themselves to torture because they have their eyes on a higher prize. That's this kind of stock that we come from. That's what we are part of. We're more than just a collection of groups of people meeting here and there. We're part of something tremendous, something right throughout the centuries, right throughout the ages, 
have grown strong in spite of the devil's best efforts to squash it. And I want to remind you of that because you guys have been going through some challenging times. And you've been going through some, some deep valleys, but you're not going through that alone. I want to encourage you to read Hebrews 12. Again, it speaks of this cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses in Scripture, but also a cloud of witnesses right throughout the centuries that are cheering you guys on and say, come on, show for East London, there are better days ahead. Come on, show for East London, you are just beginning to taste something of what God is going to do in you. And as I was thinking about what makes the church resilient and what makes the church strong, I'm so thankful that we're still in a nation where we can celebrate some of the traditional pillars of our Christian faith like the celebrations around Christmas and around Passover and, and those things. And, and so I want to start off this morning by talking to you guys about the four pillars of Christianity. And I'm, uh, sort of the title for this morning is Between the Grave and the Mountain. Between the Grave and the Mountain. It's space in between Jesus' resurrection and Jesus' ascension. And in my mind, when I think of theology, when I think of my faith, I, I, I try to get visual. I try to remember it in, in, in visual um, Images because that's the way that my mind works. A lot of you guys, maybe your mind works like my wife's. She doesn't forget anything ever, all right? Um, it doesn't matter whether it's written down or something that she has heard. Nothing gets forgotten. And, and she unfortunately expects the same of me, right? So she expects me to remember what we ate 20 years ago or, you know, uh, where she bought that dress or what I bought her when. And, and I, you know, I remember how beautiful she looked and all of that, but the exact details very often about you know, the things that she told me like five minutes ago, so you need to go, you need to buy this, this and that. It's only three things, right? And I repeat after I walk out the door and it's like, you know, so what was it? Was it this or was it that? But if you were to say 1995, Peter Hendricks, World Cup try against David Kempisi, I can remember the exact moment where I was. I can see him rounding David Kempisi, running... You know, with his fist in the air as he, as he scores the try, and the commentator says, Peter Hendricks, Peter Hendricks, Peter Hendricks. I can remember it because it's visual. It's in my mind. I can also remember Alan Donald and Lance Klusner and a certain run out. It's edged into my memory, all right? So I, I'm sorry. I, I think I just reminded some of you guys of something that you tried very hard to forget, all right? But, but that's my mind. My mind works in... Images, and I think that's why Andre and I, we enjoy each other's company. We love movies and, and stuff. But, but when I think of the incarnation, I think of Jesus' birth, I've, I've got the manger in my mind. I've got the manger in my mind, that, that picture of, of, of vulnerability, where the king of the universe, the, the creator of heaven and earth, if you can fly that slide, the king of the universe, he comes and he becomes a little baby. He becomes vulnerable. He becomes human. He becomes someone who's at the mercy of his mom and his dad. And he's born not into this palace, but, but born into this, this humble environment. And it reminds me of that moment when I think of the manger, when there was this invasion of heaven, literally invading earth. Heaven's fullness, heaven's will, heaven's desire coming and invading earth. Invading the lives of, of Mary and Joseph, the lives of the, of the shepherds, the lives of the people living in Galilee and in Judea and, and eventually circling out from there and invading the whole earth. And he's still busy invading the lives of people. And as I was praying for you guys this morning, I felt this so powerfully. God saying that you need to be ready for this invasion. That there's a fresh invasion. A, a Jesus is wanting to become Emmanuel to some of you again close to you again, where it's not just a story that we just think about on, on Christmas Day, but it is a living reality that God is Emmanuel. He is the king of the universe, but hey, we are not worshiping him from a distance. He's not God who's just watching us from a distance. He's close to us and he feels us and he knows us and he understands us. And for 33 years, Jesus lived as a human being, lived as a man who had the spirit of God upon him, but he was a human being, fully human. It, it is such a mind-boggling concept that, that many of the, the, the ancient writers, um, many of the Gnostic Gospels, the things that aren't included in our Bible for a reason, 
They struggle to come to terms with Jesus' humanity. The Gospel of Thomas and, and so forth struggle to come to terms with the fact that Jesus was fully human. And like for 30 years, didn't perform any miracles. Can you imagine that? Jesus embraced the limitations of being human. He lived in a tough environment, lived with a mom and a dad who were human, brothers and sisters who were human. They were poor, didn't have it all together, poor fishermen community, a couple of hundred people living in Nazareth. And Jesus must have been confronted with many times when people suffered hunger. He must have been confronted with many times people being ill, and yet Jesus didn't at, those, at that moment step out and perform a miracle. He waited for the right time. So he understands, and that's why Scripture says, he's our high priest that understands us, sympathizes with us, knows our weaknesses, and he's the one that has gone into the heavenlies. And because we have this high priest that understands us and sympathizes with us, the Bible says, we can enter boldly into his presence. We can draw near into a throne room of grace. Why? Because of the manger. Because for, for 30 years, Jesus was human. Jesus grew hungry. Jesus grew tired. Jesus got fed up with people. Jesus got stressed. Go and read what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was stressed out of his skin, literally, so to speak. So much so that he sweated blood because of the anxiety that wanted to come upon him. He was fully human. And the manger reminds me of that. And, and from the manger, sort of in my theology, my mind goes to from the manger to the, to the cross. And, and there on the cross, Jesus bled and he died for you and for me. And the cross reminds me that Jesus is both loving and forgiving and just. It's all of those things in one. Because sometimes you can have, I don't know, often in our parenting skills, you've got one person that's more loving and the other person is more just then. And, and that's why we need both parents sort of involved because we bring the balance, amen? We bring the balance to the parenting, but, but God is all of this. Jesus is all of this. He's so incredibly loving that He loves us just as we are, but He's also just. And so sin has to be punished. There has to be punishment for sin because God is just. All of us who have ever been hurt, all of us who have ever had a crime committed to us, we know that justice is a good thing. And justice is needed. And one day, God will come back to judge both the living and the dead. But for now, within this lifetime, he has chosen to put all of his vengeance upon Jesus. And so it was my sin, my brokenness, my rebellion that took Jesus to the cross. But in that moment, the most powerful words were spoken. And so when I think of the cross, I think of spiritual warfare. I think of the greatest act of spiritual warfare that ever took place and the greatest declaration of war that sent shockwaves into the kingdom of darkness and still reverberates right throughout the ages with Jesus' words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It, it shocked all of creation, all of the forces of darkness because they poured all of their vengeance, all of their hatred upon Jesus and Jesus turned it around. Turned the anger, the hatred, the betrayal, all of those things as he hung there naked with people screaming at him, shouting at him, if you are the Christ, come down, prove yourself. Jesus said, Father, they don't have a clue. Forgive them. And so when the word comes, the prophetic word that he will turn it around, I want you to think of the cross, the moment of greatest shame where the devil has his final victory, he thinks, but he had no clue about the empty grave three days later. And so from the cross, our theology goes to the grave and, and it goes to this moment when it is demonstrated to us that the, the cross, as amazing as it is and as powerful as it is, the story doesn't end at the cross. The story doesn't end with all of Jesus' disciples running away from him and only a couple of women staying behind. How's that for success, eh? You pour out your life for three years into these guys and you train them and you equip them and you inspire them and you believe in them and then at the moment when you need them the most, they are gone. That's not where the story ends. That's the empty grave. And, and I don't know where you are in your story, where you are in your faith journey, where you are in how you feel about Jesus and the next step that he can take with you, but there is always the empty grave for us.
We don't pilgrimage to a Mecca. We don't pilgrimage to some place where we have to go and, and stare at some dead person. Our King is alive. Our God is risen. And the greatest pilgrimage is the one from our heart to His. That's all where we need to travel. That's the only pilgrimage you have to go on is from your heart to the throne room of heaven. And it is accessible. It's a journey of one prayer at a time, one breath at a time. That's the only pilgrimage we need to take. And then from the grave, we move to the Mount of Olives where Jesus ascends and he goes to his Father, but he gives us authority. It gives us purpose. And he says, not only are you forgiven and loved, but you are people with purpose. And I'm investing all of my authority in you. You will now represent me. When I think of the mountain, I think of privilege. And I think of honor that Jesus gives us to represent him. He says, where you go, I will go. He will take me wherever. And and I'm encouraged by that to anchor myself in in the midst of, of so much change My family and I, we're going through a season of of change again where there's a a deep shaking taking place and I'm being shaken in ways that I I thought, God, but you know, we've been through a shaking like this before and I thought everything that rattled and shook, you know, it, it already rattled and already shook and we threw this, but now I'm being shaken again. And I'm like, I have to take my eyes off my circumstances. I have to take my eyes off my emotions and I, and I, sorry, my friend, you look just like a guy in Somerset West. You look like a Louis. What's your name there at the back? The Tinas. Tinas, I just want to pray for you quickly. Father, I thank you for Tinas, Lord. I thank you for your presence upon him. I thank you, Lord, for the joy that he carries, Lord God, on him, Lord. I thank you for your word that lives in his heart. I thank you for the sword that you have given him, God, to use your word, Lord God, as a not, not God as a, as a chainsaw, but as a scalpel that will cut to the dividing sun of bone and marrow, spirit and soul, God. I thank you for just the fresh anointing upon him, Lord, where he will dip him into, a, into the river of your word like never before. And God, I, I just see, I see you, Tina, just carrying this cloud with you of a love for God's word that God is going to manifest through you. And so, God, I just want to bless you for my brother, God. I thank you, Lord, for yeah, I got an anointing upon him, Lord, that will be contagious. There's, there's a divine encounter, Tina's waiting for you with Jesus in a very special way. That this word is going to burn in your lungs, God. I thank you for the prophetic, Lord, anointing over his life. His, your word shut up in his bones, God, in an amazing way. Lord, stuff that's going to be written through him and released through him, Lord, that is going to bring about change, Lord God, in very practical ways. It just sends practical theology, practical plans, practical outflow of deep spiritual truths in a very practical way. And I feel the Lord says, Tinas, don't discount the things that he's saying to you, that it's too unspiritual, it feels too practical, but God has given you a gift to make his word and his spiritual truths very practical, very digestible to those around you. So Father, thank you, God, for that. In Jesus, in Jesus' name. And and, and so I'm, I'm I'm anchoring my faith again in the midst of my own shaking, something constant, something more powerful than what I am. And I'm I'm leaning back into our traditions as as a faith community and even celebrating things that I I didn't celebrate before with with renewed commitments. And God, I'm thankful that we live in a nation where we can celebrate something as precious as your birth. We live in a nation where we can still celebrate Passover, embrace moments where you can celebrate church. Embrace moments where you can celebrate on a Sunday. This is a celebration. This is what anchors us as believers, where God gives us the community and the fellowship of the saints, because then I can be encouraged by Christ in you. It has happened to me so often nowadays that just with our masks on, we get together with believers, and I can see something in someone's eyes. I can see life there. Because I deal with a lot of people just where I'm walking, and and I, I see emptiness in their eyes. You know, we just have our masks on and and I think we've grown a little bit more adept now at reading eyes, haven't we? Because you have to look for some sort of life and you can see it when it's there and you can see it when it's not there. And to be with each other and to sense the life, something happens here. Why? Because it's Christ, the hope of glory, the spirit of resurrection inside of you and inside of me. And there's something that happens that reminds me that I am better and I'm more when I'm with you. 
Christ has put something of Him in you that I need. And I'm poorer if you don't bring your gift. I'm poorer when you don't pitch. I need you to be everything God has destined you to be. Because we need each other. It's the way God has designed it. It's the way He has designed it. You can skip that next slide and go to the scripture in 1 Corinthians. Paul is writing to his friends in Corinth. And, and if you read the letter to the Corinthians, um, there were actually three letters written to the church in Corinth. We only have two. It's a little bit of a messed up group of people. They give me a lot of hope for myself and, and for a lot of my friends because they're like all over the place. Right? They live in a very materialistic, sexually charged city. A lot of idolatry. The guys are fighting with each other. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But Paul loves them and he, he speaks to them and he ministers to them and he encourages them. And one of the things he says to them in 1 Corinthians 15 is, I would remind you, my brothers and my sisters, of the gospel that I preach to you. And one of the reasons we come together is to remind each other. Amen. We need to be reminded sometimes because we, we, we have YouTube and social media and newspapers. And, and I don't know how often you read in a newspaper just that, hey, better days are ahead. Hey, you, you can make it. Hey, we've got awesome times ahead of us in South Africa. I don't know. When was the last time you read that in a, in a newspaper? It just doesn't happen, okay? And that's why we need to remind each other of what God says. We need to remind each other of God's track record because God's track record determines our, determines our future expectation. When we, when we read past news of anything else, you grow despondent. Like, oh God, another this, another that, another, oh. I just like, you read scripture and you're like, oh, another miracle. Oh, another time God came through. Ah, oh, another time God turned it around. Ah, oh, another time when it looked like all things were lost and hope broke through. I have hope for the future. All right, so we've got to remind ourselves. Every opportunity we have, we have to remind ourselves of what God has done because he has done it once, he will do it again. And so Paul says, I want to remind you, my friends, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received I'm going to say hallelujah. I celebrate the day. My sister, when did you get saved? Can you remember? Before you were 12. My goodness, so that, that, that was a long time ago. All right, we celebrate that day. All right? We celebrate the day when you received the gospel that was preached to you because it changed your life. All right, in your children's lives and grandchildren. Yes, changed lives. A chain of events was set in motion. All right, and then Paul says, I want to remind you of the gospel that you received. Celebrate that day, saints. Celebrate the day when you received the gospel. I was three years old when I received the gospel. I celebrate that moment when I knelt down next to the bed with my father and we prayed the prayer of salvation. I celebrate that. I celebrate the fact that I, I came back to the Lord when I was five years old. When my mom took me into the bathroom and drove out the demon of fighting between me and my brother, I celebrate that my bum celebrated it as well. She's like, drove that thing out of me. I thank God for a mom that loved me enough to discipline me. You know, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry mom, all right? You've got to, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. But I thank God for a mom that loved me enough and preached at me preach the gospel into me over and over again together with my dad. We need to celebrate what God has done in our lives. We need to remind ourselves where we come from. We need to remind ourselves of what God has done in us. And that's what Paul does here. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. And we know, ask my wife, I'm still being saved as well. It's a, it's a process. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, he says, I'm I want you to hold on to the word. Showface London, I want to say to you, hold on to the words and the promises that God has given you. Hold on to it, right? Go back to those words. Revisit those words. Hold on to it because God is faithful. Look at what he says when he speaks about Jesus' resurrection. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. He says, first things first, strip everything else away, right? Forget about all the other stuff. Strip it away. Narrow it down to the most important thing. It is this. That Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah. And there are a lot of things we could be disagreeing with, with each other, even as the body of Christ. There are a lot of stuff we could be making doctrine of and build walls between us. And he says, strip all of those things away and get back down to the basics. That Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah. And that changes everything about us. 
But he didn't just die for our sins. He died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And, and those words just leapt out at me again. Even as I'm busy navigating through my own changes, that there is a promise and there is a prophecy and that there is a God who's faithful to his word. And once he has spoken, he will fulfill it. Once he has started it, he will finish it. He is still the way maker. He's still the promise keeper. He's still the one that speaks and it will be done. His word will not return unto him void. God sent Jesus to die for us. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't the Pharisees. It wasn't Judas that sent Jesus to the cross. It was the will of the Father according to his promise that I will provide a lamb, perfect, spotless for your sin and for mine. And I don't have to live under condemnation. I don't have to live under shame. I can run to him knowing he has taken the full punishment for my sin. He has been faithful and he will be faithful still. Uh, Paul then goes on and he, and he says that Jesus, after he was risen from the dead, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then to more than 500 brothers at a time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, right? So, so there he's writing to the guys in Corinth and he said, guys, if you want to meet people who met the risen Lord, I can give you a few names. <laughs> you just have to take my word for it. The resurrection is a historical fact. And if the guys really wanted to refute it, they could go and they could speak to people. There were people more than 500 at a time who met Jesus. But as I was reading that, I thought about how incredible it is that Jesus didn't just rise from the dead and then he was gone to heaven. Because he could have. I mean, it's important stuff that he had to do. He had to go and present his blood to the Father. He had to go and, and intercede for us. He had to go and just wrap everything up. And he could have gone just like that. From the grave to the skies. This is a beautiful song that we sing as well. But he didn't. He hung around for 40 days. And, and, and Peter says there, or Paul says, and he first met, he met with Peter. And we look at that now, hopefully, if I have time. But there are a couple of people I want you just quickly to, to have a look at with me of people that Jesus met whilst he hung around here on earth for, for those 40 days in. And I'm going to share with you now why I feel that's important. The first person is Mary Magdalene. Um, the Bible sometimes refers to as Mary from Magdala. It's a small um, village on the Lake of Galilee as well. And Mary Magdalene, is a, it's a, a beautiful story. By the way, I hope you guys are watching The Chosen. Watching Chosen, if you haven't downloaded the app yet, download it. Watch it. It's amazing. It, it just makes the Bible come alive, right? It's even more epic than the epic mini Bible series. It is amazing. It's so anointed. It is incredible. And Mary, really her character and her, her person really comes to the fore there as well. But in the Bible, we know there are many Marys, at least five that we, that we know of, just off the top of our heads. I keep on forgetting one, so I just remember four. But it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, uh, Martha's sister, Mary, the uh, mother of James and John, and then Mary Magdalene as well, and then there was another Mary as well. But there are at least five of them in Scripture, right? And so this Mary Magdalene, um, right throughout the centuries, some people have confused her with the, the prostitute, the woman that Jesus forgave. There's no scriptural um, uh, support for that view, right? That that was the woman. But irrespective of what her background was, we know that she suffered so much hurt, so much pain, so much devastation, that at one stage there were seven demons. Seven normally speaks of total control, completion. Seven demons that controlled her life, that formed and shaped her identity. And she was known as this demon-possessed woman. Someone who was so broken on the inside that she had these seven unclean spirits who controlled her for most of her life until, hallelujah. Aren't you guys thankful for those until moments? Hey, until, come on, until she met Jesus and everything changed. And the Redeemer, the lover of her soul walked into her life and those demons trembled and they fled. And she was changed because she met Jesus. And Jesus changed her whole life. The Bible says that, that Mary, together with other women, they ministered to Jesus and to the disciples. And from their income, they ministered to the needs of Jesus. So it looks like Mary was quite an affluent lady and, and she provided financially. It's just incredible, I think, in church still. It's amazing how women serve. It's incredible, just a blessing that women are. We are so thankful. I'm thankful for my wife. 
I'm thankful for ladies, all right? I thank God that He created women. Hey? Amen. Praise God. From Adam right till today, all men say, Amen, brother. Preach it. We're thankful that God created women. But there's something so powerful, something so amazing about the capacity that God has given women to serve. And here's Mary, and, 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 and she becomes part of this group of disciples, which was mind-boggling, all right, because rabbis didn't invite women to become their followers. Rabbis just invited men. Women weren't even allowed to read scripture in the synagogue. All right, and here comes Jesus and he invites this woman and he invites this woman who was a demon-possessed woman. She had this reputation and he invites her and, he, and she becomes part of his inner circle. And then Jesus dies. So I want you to just picture this and imagine what must have happened to her heart. Right, the person that gave her a sense of identity and a sense of purpose, that gave her a place to belong, that gave her a reason to hope that tomorrow I will not be forgotten. There's someone who believes in me. There's someone who has a purpose for my life. He is taken away from her. And we, we meet Mary where she's at the tomb in, in John 20 verse 11. And I, I don't have that scripture up there yet, but I just want to backtrack from the slides and go to verse 11. Mary had been to the tomb early on Sunday morning, um, very early, it was still dark. She comes there, the tomb is empty. She goes back, she tells John and Peter. John and Peter, they have a bit of a race, a five kilometer uh, a park run to the grave. John is a little bit younger than Peter. He gets to the grave first. He's a little bit shaken. He doesn't go in. Peter, always we know, is the guy who's always very energetic, doesn't think before he does anything, goes into the tomb. He sees the empty grave clothes there. John comes in after him. John realizes Jesus is risen from the dead. Peter's still a bit confused. They go back to the other disciples. Mary eventually catches up, and this is where we find the story. Mary stands outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. These three verses have really ministered to my heart so beautifully, and I want to share this with you. There was something about Mary that so encourages me that, that here we find Mary. She didn't have the strength to go back to the other disciples. Maybe she didn't even know whether she'd be welcome there. Maybe she had all sorts of questions. How would they now react to me as a, as a woman when Jesus isn't there? Because you know, some of those disciples, they were some rough guys. Right? John and James, the one stage, they wanted fire to come down and to destroy a village, right? You never knew with the sons of thunder what would, what would happen. Peter had just forsaken Jesus. Things were so uncertain. But what Mary knew was the only place that she could be was the last place where she had seen Jesus. She went back to the last place that she saw Jesus, in the tomb. And she's there and she's, she's weeping and, and her heart is broken. And, and, and the Bible says she, she, as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. And I felt in my heart as that song came earlier this morning and Andre sang for us again, just that prophetic song, that God is wanting to make things new, that He's wanting to turn things around. That for some of us, God is wanting to invite us to look a little bit closer at the moments where you feel you have lost something. The moments where you feel death reigned over life. The moments where you feel you have lost something that has never been replaced again. Because Mary, she's weeping and, and she must have thought, did I see properly? Is, is the grave really empty? What's going on here? We know the story. We know Jesus risen. Mary doesn't. But she has the courage to stoop down and to, to look into the tomb again. It is time for us, church, not to shy away from the things which we have lost. It's time for us to not shy away from the things maybe that we feel have been taken away from us, but to go and to have another look. Go and have another look, but this time go with an expectation because you know something Mary didn't. You know that Jesus is risen. You know that, that Jesus didn't leave the tomb like, yay, I need to get to my disciples quickly. I need to get to those 12 guys, tell them I'm alive, go to the 500, go to James and whoosh, gone I am. Jesus hung around at the tomb. 
Jesus waited for this woman. Jesus waited for Mary. Knew that this, this, this woman that is broken and weeping and mourning, knew that she was more than a disappointment, more than her tears. Knew that she had a crucial role to play and he waited for her. Before she meets Jesus, she, she meets the, the two angels and, and these two angels, they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? And I, and I must confess to you, for years I read that, 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 that question in such a condemning way, actually. I read it like, woman, you should know better. Why are you weeping? Woman, you should be over this. What's going on with you? In actual fact, if we know anything about God's heart, know anything about Jesus, then we understand that's not the way that God's heart is. He's not asking that question from a distance because if you can pick up the story in verse, um, verse 14, we see how Jesus enters the scene. He says, now when she had said this, she confessed, she said that they've taken away my Lord, they've taken away my, my identity, they've taken away my security, they've taken away my sense of purpose, they've taken away my hopes and my dreams, my innocence, my, my, my song, they've taken away my hope for the future. I've lost everything. I don't know where to get it back, she's saying. I've lost everything. and I don't know how to get it back. When she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and she did not know that it was Jesus. How many of us, we, we are in our pain, we're in our moments where we're losing things and we are feeling things are slipping away from us and it feels to us that Jesus has left us completely, and yet he's right there. We just don't recognize him. We just don't see him. I believe the Holy Spirit is here, and what you guys are going through as a church is an invitation for you, not just to journey through your, your loss in terms of, of Kim's life and what you guys have gone through, but to receive the invitation from God to experience something that JP is experiencing, that reality that the resurrection is real that life has won over death and that you can look into moments in your life and maybe for the first time, see Jesus. Because something happens here, the grave is turned into the throne room because of Jesus. Jesus appears and he changes everything. Uh, Jesus says to a woman, why are you weeping? So he repeats the question, whom are you seeking? And, and I was reminded of my, of my girls and when they, they come home and, you know, I know them. And, and so I can see when they're trying to hide things from me. And I can see when they have had a tough day. And, and sometimes my days are long, but I, I try at the end of every day, go and lie next to them. And uh, Annika's grade eight now, and I go and lie next to her in bed. And we just chat. We just chat and they put their heads on my, my chest. And, and I can ask, baby, why are you sad? Baby, you're quiet today. What, what happened? And she opens up her heart and starts chatting to me what happened at school. And I realized that's Father God's heart. It's not, hey, you, you're there at the back. Why are you weeping? You're in church. Don't you know he's risen? How dare you be sad? Don't you know how the story ends? Hish, come on. No. He asks you, why are you weeping? What are you missing? What are you feeling? And then he engages and something happens. I'm wrapping up in the next three minutes. I don't know which watch to look at here. I'll ignore that one. All right. Go away. <laughs> She's supposing him to be the gardener. Isn't that so typical? When we're overcome by our grief and just what we've lost, that the king of kings can be right next to us and we just see him as, to someone else. The blessing comes and we miss it. The encouragement comes and we miss it. But the Holy Spirit wants to open our eyes this morning. Sir, if you have carried him away, if, you take, if you've taken him, I don't know what you would have done with his body, but please just tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. I'm not even sure if Mary knew what she was going to do with the body. She, her prayer, I think, was just this. Just give me Jesus. Just give me. You can have all the rest, that song says. You can have all the rest. 
Just give me Jesus. And I believe that's why Mary was the first person to see the risen Lord. Think about it. This demon-possessed woman, not even allowed to read Scripture in the synagogue. No man would listen to her. She's the first person that sees the risen Lord. And she's the first person that Jesus speaks to after being raised from the dead. The last becomes first. What a great honor that he gives not to Peter, but to any of the other disciples, but to this woman that just knew, I just need Jesus. He's my everything. And she hears his voice. She grabs onto him. She holds onto his feet. And I think she just wept and wept and laughed, weeping and laughing, weeping and laughing, weeping and laughing. And Jesus stands there for a few moments and eventually tells her, don't hang on to me. Mary, go, tell my disciples. And here's the beautiful thing. When we bring our weeping to Jesus, we hold on to him. He welcomes us. He gives us life. And then he sends us to go. And Mary is the first person that sees the resurrected Lord. She's the first person to whom the resurrected Lord speaks. And she's the first person who ever preaches a message given by the resurrected Lord. She's the first person to receive a commission from God. Go and tell my brothers. The first command given by the resurrected Lord is given to her. Who knows what Jesus wants to give you for the person and the people around you when you meet him in your pain and you allow him to come alongside you. Jesus changed everything for Mary and he's busy changing everything for you.